Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our May 21st Thursday afternoon media availability following the Emergency Advisory Committee meeting of Council. You'll hear from the Mayor momentarily, followed by Interim City Manager Adam Laughlin, and then we'll have questions to both of them. And once again, we're aided very capably by the interpretive services of Deanne DeAndre and Kevin Holt, for which we are grateful. Over to you, Mr. Mayor. Well, thanks again to Deanne and, and Kevin, and uh, also to my wife, Sarah, for the home haircut. Um, uh, so thank you all for tuning in. Uh, today, uh, we agreed once again to renew Edmonton's state of local emergency. We are still very much in the midst of a active public health emergency, and our city administration requires the agility that a state of local emergency provides, um, because we need to be able to be nimble if things turn on us. And as we've seen, they can turn very quickly with this virus. Uh, uh, so far, we've been very, very fortunate in Edmontonians and entrepreneurs who serve them uh, and frontline workers who serve them have been tremendously diligent with hand washing and PPP, PPE and self-isolation. If, uh, if that varies in any way uh, and the virus gets behind our defenses, we need to be able to act quickly. This is the most important reason why we continue to be in a state of emergency, so that we don't have to wait for city council to make decisions. Now, I'm very pleased with the way overall that the city is managing this relaunch, given that we're only given the guidelines to do this relaunch last week. Uh, and specifically, I know that the grade one and two students from Meadowlark School, who I spoke with earlier this week, are going to be super happy that their voices were heard as they were lobbying me very hard about playground reopening, which will happen tomorrow. Um, and I uh, spoke to them earlier this week and they said, when, when? I said, we'll have news on Thursday. I promised them we'd get back to them on Thursday and I'm happy to tell you that tomorrow the tape will come down, but uh, the signs will go up with important guidance on them. So I know people have felt cooped up in their homes without access to some of the outdoor amenities that they enjoy so much in their community and across the city. So I know this news uh, about those amenities reopening will be very, very welcome. And I also know that some parents have been struggling with managing work from home while watching over children and helping them out with online school. So I hope parents, as well as their children, will enjoy being back out. Now, I would, again, encourage people to still ensure that they are following the guidelines that are in place and stay safe. And Adam will talk more on the safety measures parents should take into consideration when visiting playgrounds or playing courts. Now, last week, on a more serious note, I spoke bluntly about the financial hardships the city continues to face. And I've been stressing the difficult financial position the city is in due to COVID-19 since the very beginning of this pandemic. Now, the message hasn't changed, and the situation is no better. In fact, it continues to deteriorate. But I'm glad to see that folks understand tangibly what is at stake if our provincial and federal partners do not do their part to help struggling municipalities. I mentioned transit offhand last week because it's such a visible municipal essential service, but I could have easily mentioned a number of essential services the city provides that are also fundamentally at risk. Essential services we all rely on, such as transit, fire, police, garbage collection, many other key services that are still operating. Now, I'm not trying to be deliberately overly alarmist. I am, however, pushing an early panic button and trying to make tangible what is now at stake. For the last few months, fellow mayors and myself from across the country have been, perhaps too softly, sounding the alarm on our financial difficulties. And provincial governments, as well as the federal government, need to be part of this conversation, urgently. Mayors from across the Edmonton metro region made this clear last Friday, for example, when we all penned a joint letter to the provincial government asking the government of Alberta to immediately join our efforts to seek substantive discussions with our federal government to take action to alleviate the financial difficulties all Alberta municipalities, especially our big cities, are facing. For the residents and businesses in our region who continue to rely on municipal services, Inaction is simply not an acceptable option. 
Now, I was pleased to hear that the Minister of Municipal Affairs, who is, after all, from Edmonton, is very familiar with our region, state that his government is committed to working with municipalities to address our challenges and that the provincial government is open to working with the feds to determine the financial needs of our cities and towns. We will be following up again with the minister on this issue and hope our collective calls to action are heard and addressed in a timely fashion. A quick and complete economic recovery for our province depends immensely on the ability of our municipalities to efficiently and effectively recover in support of families and businesses. We ask that all levels of government work alongside us as we face the challenges ahead. And together, that way, we will all be more successful. Now, as I mentioned earlier in today's meeting, I understand the Prime Minister will be meeting with Premiers today, and I'm hoping that we will hear something by tomorrow about where they stand on working to help municipalities across this province and across this country. But now I'll turn it over to Adam to talk about some of the specific updates on where things are at with what's open, what's coming soon near you, and then of course, be very happy to answer your probing questions in a few minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks uh, all of you for being here today. and. Lots of thanks to Edmontonians. Uh, you've done your part uh, this past week to ensure that the, the reopening of our economy happens safely. Uh, people are beginning to carefully venture back out and out of their homes, uh, which is important uh, for us to, to advance the economy. Uh, but more movement in public uh, means a greater potential for transmission of this virus. More than ever, Alberta Health's recommendations for practicing physical distancing, enhanced hygiene and sanitization, and limiting exposure to gatherings will save lives. Today at the Emergency Advisory Committee, I shared some of the city's decisions that will ease restrictions and give Edmontonians safe options for adding more interest, activity, and fun back into their lives. Every decision is backed by an assessment of what is necessary, sustainable, and affordable. Already we have identified some relaunch realities that will influence our work. I mentioned today that the public health guidelines that are being provided by the province, from our perspective, are the rules that drive us. We continue to rely on everyone to do their part, but shared accountability between levels of governments, businesses, stakeholders, and Edmontonians will define our success. Edmontonians are eager, sometimes impatient, for getting their lives, businesses, and communities back on track. Every decision we make has to balance the city's needs for stability and future prosperity with the residents' needs for immediate and complete relief. That will include some difficult choices for continued closure, delays, or modifications of the services that you're used to. Our environment continues to evolve and for every careful, intentional decision we make, we are still open and responsive to the possible need for adjustment. In the past week, the city has taken important steps to build out the provincial guidelines for restarting the economy and develop implementation plans. We talked last week about the patio, uh, outdoor retail patio expansion, and May 19th was the launch for that. And, and again, we all have a role to play in supporting local e economic revival, but we all have a, an important role to play to make sure that we honour and respect the, the guidelines that are provided by the province. There are, uh, all, there's also work on the shared streets. Uh, there's 15 locations that are currently in place. Uh, we'll be looking at another 15 uh, and, and continuing to look at other opportunities, but uh, uh, tomorrow we'll be opening uh, four more locations, uh, essentially the areas in and around East Edmonton, Borden Park, 112th Avenue, um, adjacent to 76th Street, 76th Street, from 112th Avenue to 110th Avenue, 110th Avenue from 76th Street to 75th Street, and on 75th Street from 110th Avenue to Ada Boulevard, and that information will be provided in a press release. We're also relaunching several outdoor amenities uh, starting tomorrow. Some spaces will, will be open, even though that it may take us some time to 
to pull off the yellow tape or put up new signs and, and do the necessary maintenance work. Other amenities do require more time to work through operating issues, and we ask Edmontonians for their patience as we continue to, to assess these uh, opportunities. As the mayor mentioned, uh, uh, we expect Edmontonians to enjoy these spaces safely by practicing social distancing, good hygiene, and limiting exposures to the groups. To groups. For the reopening to be successful, Edmontonians must adhere to all public health requirements and abide by the new rules, which are the guidelines that will be in place. The reopening applies to playgrounds and outdoor fitness parks, which include 450 sites in the city, outdoor courts and courses, which in include tennis, pickleball, basketball, volleyball, and disc, disc golf, and outdoor skate parks, and, uh, of which there are 11 of these parks around the city. And what I flagged for the Emergency Advisory Committee today, Council, that uh, we've had um, previous challenges with the skate parks in terms of, of respecting the, the public health orders and the restrictions that are in place. So we're going to be keeping a close eye on those. And, and should we not see good compliance, we may make a decision to, to close those again. So again, we all need to do our part to respect uh, the restrictions that are in place and ensure that we're doing everything to um, minimize the impact of, of transfer of the virus. Edmonton.ca is always your best source of information. Uh, we encourage people to check that out and get the details. Edmontonians should be aware that the usage of these spaces will be monitored by enforcement officials who have the ability to educate, warn, but fine if individuals are not respecting the rules. Other openings, um, the Animal Care and Control Centre, we're looking at a, a phased relaunch, uh, which is planned for May 25th, which will include the intake of healthy stray dogs dropped off by Edmontonians. The intake volumes will, will dictate the, the ability to provide that service. Um, the centre is working with the, hum the Edmonton Humane so Society and other rescue groups to ensure that the community can accept these unclaimed dogs. Um, also on May 25th, uh, 25th, the center will increase microchip scanning for found dogs to assist in reunification. The intake of healthy cats will be addressed in the second phase of the center's reopening, which we don't have a date yet for that. We also identified that we're um, gonna be rein reinstating uh, e-parking fees uh, this is to address the ongoing parking congestion issues and will reinstate these parking fees effective June 8th. We'll also be providing a 30 minute grace period uh, to allow folks to take advantage of the curbside pickup and, and drop off. Um, these uh, decisions are going to require close monitoring of, of possible alignment with any resumption of the transit service um, and with the expansion of the outdoor retail and patio spaces. Uh, we're going to be completing more disinfecting of the e-park machines uh, and we're going to continue to do the public e education around the safe use of the e-park machines and hand sanitization and payment options. Also uh, good to announce that effective June 15th we're going to be looking at reopening the zoo uh, to the public but it will come with measures to keep the public uh, safe. Um, the operating restrictions will include limiting capacity to 50%, controlling entry to uh, 90 tickets per 30 minutes, limiting ticket sales to online only, and we'll be establishing a one-way flow in the park, in the zoo, sorry, and encouraging visitors to wear face masks. Um, switching gears a bit, the, the city did mail out over 400,000 property tax notices today. Paperless subscribers will see their notices online. The payment deadline is June 30th, uh, but this year late penalties will not be charged until September 1st. We are offering this flexibility for those who cannot pay due to impacts of COVID-19. If you must hold back some or all of your payment, payment, please remember that for those who pay annually, the entire amount will become due on September 1st. For those who are on a monthly payment plan, withdrawals for any unpaid amounts from June, July, August, and September will be made September 1st. I've said this before uh, in these uh, challenging times, and especially with some of the financial pressures that we have. If you are in a position where you can play, pay, uh, please, 
please make efforts to do that. And we thank you for that. It allows us to continue to provide the essential services uh, that we have, keeping your community running and keeping you and your neighbors safe. Again, I want to thank Edmontonians for their resilience and ongoing support of each other and their efforts to flatten the curve and operate in a, a, a safe manner. So happy to take questions. Thank you, Adam. We have five reporters with us and a question that has come in uh, by email from Scott Johnston, and this is for the mayor, and it pertains to the request you made earlier of the city manager for additional transit data um, to bolster your case to other orders of government. And his question specifically is, how urgent is this data in the context of stage two relaunch currently anticipated to be June 19th? So a lot of the in information that the city administration has provided so far um, has been very, very helpful, but it's also focused on the shorter term, which is to say um, out to June, it's uh, 30 million and change that will be low on transit out to September, it rises above 50. Uh, some of the analysis that I'm looking for is um, based on some of the analysis in the United States, where by the way, as I mentioned earlier, federal Congress not known for doing things quickly has already pushed $25 billion in federal aid to American cities specifically for transit operations as part of their response to COVID-19. Um, so uh, uh, part of the rationale for that is that there are immediate and deep uh, shortfalls in transit systems in, uh, in all cities that run them, but basically the larger the city, the deeper the hole, Toronto being the Canadian exemplar of this, losing $20 million a week. But the more uh, concerning uh, issue that I started to look at and, and analyze last week was uh, what if it takes two years or five years for ridership levels to recover. And even if we are uh, reinstituting fares, and I think we should do that as quickly as is safe to do so from a health point of view in terms of interaction with operators and handling of paper and fair media and cash, that, that um, uh, you know, based on different assumptions about when uh, fares are reintroduced as quickly as possible and uh, how long it takes for ridership to recover, there is a uh, nine-figure um, transit challenge over several years for the city of Edmonton. Uh, it's in the billions for Toronto and Montreal and collectively across the country, uh, it's in the billions of dollars. So, uh, so administration's done great analysis focused on the short-term crisis, but I think it's fair uh, to model out what the medium and long-term exposure is, assuming a slow recovery of ridership. And given that we're going to have to put potentially more buses on uh, than we have now in order to accommodate more riders as they do come back with relaunch, uh, in order to maintain physical distancing. So we might have half as many riders, but still need just as many buses as we were running before. So that's full cost, half revenue, even if we're recovering the revenue, and, you know, two to five years for ridership to recover and fare box revenues to recover to the full amount. Um, back of the napkin, that's hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and I don't want to go back and raise property taxes uh, to try to recover it because that's going to uh, stall the economic recovery that transit and other essential services are key to. Um, and I don't want to cut police or fire or other essential services uh, that we haven't turned off uh, to pay for it. And this is why the mayors have been gently for m a couple of months now. And uh, frankly, I'm losing patience, which is, which is why we're raising the temperature around this issue of transit. Um, because the austerity that we'll be pushed into will mean either cuts to essential services or tax increases or cuts to infrastructure precisely the time when those things would hurt the economy and forestall economic recovery. So I just need the data modeled out over uh, uh, the short term and medium term and long term issues we have with transit so that we can get firm reassurance from provincial and federal governments that like their American counterparts, we're going to get help. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll go next to Keith at the Edmonton Journal. Go ahead, please, Keith. Hi, I also uh, want to ask about transit, um, specifically around the possibility of resuming the collection of fares. Uh, obviously, that's not the silver bullet to the city's financial problems, but what about that issue? And correct me if I'm wrong, 
a lot of other cities are, are not offering free transit. What's the impediment to resuming fare collection in Edmonton? Well, first of all, let's put the issue into context. If ridership is down 60 to 80 percent on a given day, then the $10 million a month we'd normally collect uh, uh, might turn into uh, 2 or $3 million a month worth of revenue if we can collect it safely. So again, it doesn't patch uh, the large hole that we have and it doesn't pay for double the space on the bus as we relaunch. Uh, to accommodate physical distancing. So fares are a fair issue. I had hesitation at the time, to be honest, about uh, eliminating fare collection, but uh, the best advice that we had um, was, was that uh, it, having people board at the front of the bus would be potentially unsafe for our operators and for the public. And I think that uh, at that stage of the crisis and still at this stage of the crisis, that's the best advice. Um, if we can find a different way to, um, uh, to collect fares than analysis, and, and we'll hear more soon as they do more work on it. Uh, in Calgary, for example, transit is not free. However, people are flashing passes from two months ago that they may or may not have repurchased online. So their transit revenue is down 10 to $15 million a month too, and it's essentially an honor system. Uh, they're, uh, unless you've got turnstiles and a tap and go or a tap and go um, smart card system in place it's very hard to uh, enforce fare collection the way we normally would in a way that uh, will be safe for our operators so um, uh, if if um, senior government officials uh, first suggestion is uh, that we should have our operators exposed to that risk again and collect fare the least they could do is buy the PPE for the operators that Edmontonians are paying for right now so um, so if we can find a safe way to do it, um, uh, even on an honor system basis, I think that will be one of the options we look at because we do need some revenue, but it does not solve the long-term uh, nine-figure problem that we have with the sustainability of public transit in this city like every other um, Canadian city. Thank you, Keith. Did you have a follow-up question? Yes, I do. The, uh, again, this relates to the or the, the potential long-term impact on transit ridership maybe being down. If that's the case, I think there's going to be pressure to maybe reduce transit service over the long term as well for a time. How would you feel about that? What are the potential disadvantages of doing that? Well, I think we heard loud and clear from Edmontonians yesterday that they, like me, see transit as an essential service and we should not be cutting back on it. We should be enhancing it for those people who depend on it with mobility challenges uh, or who need it as their only way to get to uh, their employment, particularly their essential services jobs. Uh, across the city. So I do not want to be in a situation where we're cutting back on public transit. Um, and I think that, quite frankly, if uh, this breaks down on a city by city or province by province basis, that cities that do that will struggle socially and economically, and cities that go in the other direction, ideally with provincial and federal aid, uh, to do the right thing. Uh, and ensure that there's sufficient space on transit systems to invite people back and resume their ridership and rebuild it uh, patiently over time until there's a vaccine and people feel more confident to be out in confined spaces with people who aren't in their cohort. So, um, you know, we're not going to be in a state of pandemic for the next hundred years and the transit system and the, and the the rail assets that we're building and want to build next will be there for a hundred years and uh, um, and they need to be able to continue to operate and get essential service workers to where they need to be even during periods of emergency like this so I continue to be one of the strongest public transit advocates you will find and uh, would only as a last resort uh, contemplate cuts to public transit just to be clear. Thank you. We'll go next to Jeremy Thompson in the room. Go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, I think this question is probably uh, for, for Adam, uh, but you're free to take a crack at it if you'd like. To. Um, just a question about the, um, the relaunch for uh, park space, sports fields, all that kind of stuff. We know people respond best to simple rules. Wear masks, don't wear masks, that kind of stuff. This seems very specific and very a little bit complicated, you know what I mean, as far as what sports people are allowed to play, with whom and when and where and that sort of stuff. 
how, how do you expect folks to follow these, these rules closely and properly? So I, I think each one has little nuances in terms of uh, the guidelines, which again, we're treating as rules. Um, and first and foremost, two meter physical distancing, good hygiene, and respect the gathering requirements that are restrictions that are in place. If you start there, a lot of it is taken care of. Uh, when it gets into uh, other facilities and, and um, what we're trying to do is simplify it, but if, for example, uh, the court sports, uh, tennis, pickleball, basketball, um, an another way to think of it is like you've been doing at home. If you're with your family or you're with your cohort, that's who you would play those sports with. And likewise, you would use your own equipment to do that. So we are trying to simplify. I, I think um, starting with those three restrictions, first and foremost, are the most important thing for people to do. And then when you supplement it with the guidelines, the rules, it starts to create a, create, uh, paint a clearer picture for everybody. Um, and it will take some time. So people need to be cautious when they go out and start to uh, take part in these outdoor activities. I guess I'm thinking specifically of the, um, you know, it mentioned in, in the in the uh, presentation that you, you gave the, you know, you're allowed to kick balls, you know, back and forth. I imagine that you're not allowed to, you know, throw a baseball or a football or something that, you know, it's, it gets kind of that granular, right? Yeah, so it's, uh, I think on that one, no team sports, so don't, no team activities. Uh, and then it's really around if you're playing the sport with your family or your cohort and you're using your equipment, you're fine, provided you're respecting the other restrictions that are in place from the province. As we decide to daily living, we're going to do our utmost to simplify those provincial guidelines and make sure that the rules for Edmontonians are clear. We'll go next, please, to Natasha Reeb online. Go ahead, Natasha. Thank you. My question is also for Adam. And to expand on Jeremy's questions, how do you measure compliance um, in these new uh, openings of playgrounds and sports courts? I've noticed people playing even before today on a basketball court, and I'm pretty sure that they didn't live together. So how do you actually go about um, ensuring that compliance is, that people are complying to this? It's a good question, Natasha. Um, and, and I mentioned uh, uh, skateboard parks, but the question did come up at EAC today about basketball courts. And we've seen non-compliance where folks aren't respecting the two meter physical distancing or their own equipment uh, or being with their family or cohort. Uh, so our folks have been, our, our peace officers and our, our enforcement folks have been um, exposed to this uh, for for a little while here because because uh, those activities, like you said, have been taking place and they use the measures of educate, warn and fine. Um, but it is, uh, it does require uh, engagement with the individuals that are, are participating in those activities to confirm um, that they're with their family, with their cohort and that they're uh, using their equipment. So it does require a bit of interaction and that does allow our peace officers to provide the education component related to um, the guidelines uh, that we w that the province provided for these different activities. And Adam, just one more follow-up. If, if I just want to know how, again, in terms of compliance, how the city kept an eye on in this past week with the relaunch and restaurants and bars opening. Uh, again, I noticed a lot of incidents where uh, that physical distancing wasn't being maintained, and among other things. Um, from a scale of one to ten, could you give me an idea of how you think the city did in trying to follow the Alberta health uh, guidelines on, on these orders? Peace officers were out. Uh, they were monitoring, and what I can share is that what we observed was um, folks that needed to be reminded of the rules, the the restrictions, um, and and you know the reinforcement with businesses that. Uh, they play a part in this as well. So it's it's the city, it's the businesses, it's the citizens that all play a part in this. Um, but generally, good compliance when it came to the relaunch. And I think the other thing we saw was a bit of a, a slow 
return uh, to some of these businesses and facilities that people were exercising caution uh, in terms of getting out. And again, it's, it's the ongoing reminder of uh, kind of to Jeremy's question, just reminding that these are the restrictions and these are the guidelines which are, are we're considering the rules around operations in, in, in any of these uh, facilities or outdoor amenities. Next, we'll go to Vinesh at Global. Go ahead, please. Hey, yeah, uh, this is uh, for Adam as well. And again, I, could, I just I need some clarification on, on the questions that Jeremy and Natasha asked about, you know, how how is the city going to be monitoring this? Uh, you know, there's hundreds of spaces across the city. Uh, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, the local state of emergency. You know, are you going to our people, our peace officers simply going to be driving by? Are you going to be, you know, uh, you know, looking to people to call into the city and how aggressive will the city be in terms of enforcing compliance on a go forward basis starting tomorrow? So it will be ongoing monitoring by our peace officers. Um, that, you, what you mentioned, Vinesh, related to, um, I believe it's the website where individuals can alert to concerns that they have related to individuals not following the guidelines or the restrictions that are in place by the provincial uh, Alberta Health, sorry. Um, so, so those will those will continue to be ways that we we monitor is is doing our rounds with our peace officers and if if uh, if there is uh, indications from from that uh, that tip line on the website, uh, public health will get involved, AHS will get involved. Uh, so we'll continue doing that. Um, but there is an expectation on Edmontonians to uh, honor what is being asked of. Uh, of them by the province and by the city to to do their part in making sure that um, uh, they're honoring the rules, honoring the guidelines, and and doing their part to limit the potential for this being uh, these th this virus being transmitted. So the other thing we're going to do, uh, Vinesh, is if we see non-compliance, we will take steps to close. So this is a a bit of a monitor comply. Uh, um, uh, uh, system, but if we're not seeing that, we will restrict um, because public health is priority one in this in this instance. Did you have a follow up question, Vinesh? No, that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go next to Ashley with the Edmonton Journal. Thanks for waiting. Go ahead, please. Hi. Thanks so much. Uh, this is a question, probably for the mayor. Um, I am wondering if. You've talked about how certain infrastructure projects might have to be slowed down because of a lack of revenue. I'm wondering whether any of the whether there's any talk that uh, any of the folks who have been laid off might not be able to be brought back to work. Like layoffs might become permanent if the city doesn't get additional revenue. So I don't want to speculate about people's jobs because I think that just adds to economic uncertainty. Uh, and our whole point here is that we would like to reduce economic uncertainty for the, uh, not just the households that depend on the city for their employment, especially those who are uh, in a state of temporary layoff, um, but those essential service workers are working on the front lines here today. That, that said though, we are at the point where um, it is becoming more and more budgetarily challenging for the city the further out we look uh, with the uncertainty of this virus and without um, operating support uh, uh, from senior governments, provincial and federal, for our budget challenges. Our choices are quite limited. Raise taxes to cover the shortfall. Clearly there is no appetite for that and that would not be helpful to economic recovery or to the very households that are uh, concerned right now and businesses. Um, so then you have to look at where do you cut? Do you cut those essential services and, and potentially lay more people off um, uh, or potentially extend layoffs that are already in place beyond what we had previously contemplated? Those are real cost saving options for us. The other substantial place that we can cut uh, besides human resources, uh, which reflect service levels. That means your garbage would get picked up less often. Police might get to your door slower. Um, you know, those are the kinds of services that we're still operating that, that would be uh, potentially on the table. Um, if you're not going to 
cut human resources and service levels uh, on the operating budget side, you have to go over to your infrastructure budget. And if we cut there, then just as other orders of government open the stimulus taps, we'll be, uh, uh, in Keynesian terms, pro-cyclically undermining economic recovery by pulling back on our spending to free up money from infrastructure to move it over uh, to, to cover essential services on the operating side. Um, that's what an austerity crunch looks like uh, for an order of government like us, and our situation is no different than the city of Leduc or the city of Red Deer or the city of Toronto or the city of New York. The difference is the city of New York and all other American cities have $25 billion of federal aid for transit, and we don't. Did you have a follow-up question, Ashley? I do. Um, the, uh, Mr. Mayor, you've said in the past that you don't think deficits are the right course of action for the city. Um, I'm wondering whether your opinion has changed any, uh, given the current situation, or um, whether you still stand by that position. Well, I think, I think deficit spending by orders of government who have revenues that ebb and flow with the economic long wave cycle uh, which is to say sales tax and income tax and business taxes and, and fees that, uh, that grow with economic recovery, it makes sense for them to, um, to spend counter-cyclically and use non-structural deficits to do that. Um, the city's revenues don't rise and fall that way. Right now ours are just falling and we're not sure when they're going to come back. So I don't have a, a light at the end of the tunnel, fiscally speaking, uh, to put against the money I might borrow today, which is why even a non-structural cyclical deficit is a bad idea for the city of Edmonton and any other municipality in Canada with fundamentally the same financial situation that we have. Um, what I'm really opposed to would be a structural deficit, and that's essentially what we have in public transit right now, is a structural deficit because of lower ridership, uh, setting aside fare collection. We start collecting fares tomorrow, I still have a $7 million structural deficit in transit before I start adding buses back to support physical distancing. What I don't like is um, any order of government having a structural deficit, and municipalities have been really solid performers despite the flack that we take for our budget decisions because we have to make those hard decisions because we have to balance them every year, and I don't think that should change. The orders of government that have um, uh, cyclical fiscal capacity like the provincial and federal government. This is why in economic terms we are asking them because they also borrow um, against a national balance sheet that is, that is much stronger than any individual municipality or province for that matter. Why we're asking provincial and federal governments uh, to deliver an aid package to support municipalities as federal governments in so many other countries have. One last wrap-up question from the folks online. I hear none. Thank you for being with us. We'll look forward to speaking with you next time. Appreciate you being here. Thanks, everyone.